Hijai. So, today everyone, we're going to continue our class on listening. And we're going to talk about listening to complainers, what's going on inside when people are complaining. We're going to talk about listening to people who are complaining about people that are dear to you. Excuse me. And we're going to talk about listening to people complain about you, which is the most difficult. That's in my experience. Not always easy. If someone's complaining about someone else, <laughs> you don't like that person, it's very easy to listen. I'm trying to, uh, I've got allergy season and I'm trying to open some tissues, which is why there's no noise. And uh, I wanted, it's, it's not normally allergy season for me, but it is now. Excuse me. Had it for sure. So I need to know about the audio if it's too loud or not. Can you tell me if the audio is too loud, if it's distorting or whatever? So in the last class we had last week we had spoken a little bit about about listening and I wanted to review some points and also discuss some other points, some new points. So one of the uh, one of the things I've spoken about a lot is that when you're listening especially to someone who's complaining about whatever they're complaining. It could be a situation or they could be, when you're listening to someone complain about a situation or another person, there's a little mantra that we can remember and that mantra is, behind every complaint, there's a need. Remember that. Behind every complaint, there is a need. Behind every complaint, there is a need. So, when someone's complaining about a situation or someone's complaining about another person, there's a need, there's an unmet need that they're trying to fulfill. So, if you, if you think of that or you hear that, it will be easier to listen. Because otherwise, sometimes it's very difficult to listen to people complaining. Now, before I go further... Before I go further, I want to explain that some people, by nature or by conditioning, are addicted to complaining. And sometimes complaining can be therapeutic because you need to talk about it. But addiction to complaining can be a symptom of more serious problems that that person has personally. Not serious external problems, but internal problems. And so in some cases, you're listening continually over and over again in order to help them. It actually doesn't help them. It doesn't help them solve their problem. It can actually make it worse because of their addiction to complaining and they're not complaining with the idea of being therapeutic and they're not complaining with the idea of, of um, overcoming the problem. They're just complaining because they're addicted to complaining. And in fact, some people are always looking for things to complain about. It's just their nature. And the purpose of this class is not to analyze those people, but it's to make you aware that although we want to listen to people, sometimes listening to people who just want to complain and not rectify a situation won't help them. And it could make the, it could make the situation worse 
and just rile them up and get them get intensify their need to complain or it could disturb them more about the situation because you're because they're talking about it in a healthy situation when you talk about it it helps you in an unhealthy situation when you talk about it it just gets worse let's say for example you hurt me and I'm talking about it in a healthy way and I'm trying to deal with it I'm trying to overcome it I'm trying to process my feelings about it process my thoughts I want to deal with it but let's say in an unhealthy situation I'm talking about it and it's just making it worse so you hurt me and the more I talk about it the more I the more I feel the hurt the more I dislike you the more I feel what you did is wrong and so it intensifies the problem so you don't want to facilitate that kind of hearing because if you do you're only helping the person make it worse now in the world of recovery alcoholism drug addiction or any kind of addiction I'm, I'm sure they're going to have a 12-step program for mobile phones mobile phones anonymous you know people who can't put their mobile if they put their mobile phone down, they start getting nervous, you know, they have to touch it and have it. But in any kind of 12-step program, one of the therapies is to talk about the problem. And if you talk about it, it helps relieve you of the burden of the problem. It helps you start to get in touch with your feelings about the problem. It helps you start to clarify the problem. So talking about a problem can be very useful and very therapeutic and therefore listening to someone talk about a problem can be a great service but listening to someone talk about a problem who only wants to talk about their problem and doesn't want to resolve it then you're kind of an aid you become kind of an aid to their crime and so you have to recognize the difference because uh, if you sense that a person is just talking because they just like to complain and your listening is not going to help, then either you can tell them, you know, I don't think we should talk about this because I don't think this is going to help you. Or you can ask them, do you want to overcome this problem or do you just want to talk about it? Because if we don't talk about it in a proper way, by talking about it, you're just going to become more disturbed by the problem. So we need, we need to be aware of that. And I would say that's probably the minority of cases. I would say the majority of cases, people want to talk to overcome the problem. Now, there's a third case. And the third case is the person who want to talk to overcome the problem, but doesn't have the skills or doesn't have the consciousness or the desire or the need to overcome the problem. So they just want they they just want someone to sympathize with their problem. And they'll always want someone to sympathize with their problem. But they're not capable of overcoming the problem for whatever reason. It could be emotional immaturity, it could be that they need uh, different kinds of help to overcome the problem. They could be severely damaged. It may be a problem they're never going to be able to overcome in their entire life. And I've seen in situations like this where you have people who just, they're talking because they want sympathy from other people because they feel um, that the problem is so difficult. And they, they're not actually capable of solving it. They're not actually capable of hearing solutions. And they actually want other people to solve it for them. I've seen that. And so the way they want other people to solve it is by sympathy and by doing some magic so they don't have to do anything. So what I've seen in situations like that is that when the person who's listening doesn't solve the problem for them, they become upset with the person who's listening. So in those kinds of situations, listening doesn't actually help. So you may you may listen to someone in the mood of helping and then they want to talk again and then you might see that they're going through the same things and, and nothing got better. And then you talk again 
and they're saying the same things and nothing's getting better and then you realize they're not actually capable of handling this they're going to need some kind of help to deal with this it's a serious problem or due to their nature it may not be so serious but they can't handle it they don't know how to deal with it they're very weak they're very dependent they're they're hoping other people can solve the problem for them and so then you're listening what i've seen is you're listening eventually upsets them and upsets you it upsets them because you can't do anything for them you can't change the way they think you can't change the way they act and you um yeah so and you get upset because you're listening over and over again and it's going on you know a few days a week for hours and nothing's happening and so you feel that your listening is not valuable it's actually wasting your time now and they're just getting upset with you so it's going nowhere so whenever whenever we're listening to someone our mood is i'm listening to you to help you clarify and help you process your own feelings and own thoughts and just just get it off your chest just you know reduce that emotional stranglehold that the problem has on you and you do that by a lot uh, we do that by listening and it helps the person so when we see that it's helping the person then yes we're doing we're doing a service but with some people who have more mental psychological emotional problems or who are going through a situation that needs more help than just listening then that listening process may not work and i just wanted you to be aware of that so it doesn't mean you think oh this person they're weird i won't listen but it just means to be aware if your listening is actually helping them become clear so at the end of the conversation you could ask well did that help you and do you have a clearer idea about how to deal with this and and how do you feel about this and if they say no it didn't help or no i'm not clear or whatever then it may not always be the case but it may be the case that your listening is not your listening is not going to help them so that's a consideration now there's some difficult other difficulties in listening if somebody is complaining about a situation and you feel the same way about the situation it's very easy to listen to actually it's enjoyable to listen to do <laughs> do due to our conditioned nature we like hearing bad things about people or situations that we don't like so if you're talking to me about so and so prabhu and i think so and so prabhu is a little strange or weird he does things that i don't agree with and you say the same thing it's very easy to hear that isn't it so <laughs> but the problem is when you're listening you don't want to say oh yeah i know him he's so weird he's so fanatical you, you know you don't want to say that so your job in listening is to not add your opinion in less they want it unless they ask for it so if you're in the listener mode you just listen and you feedback oh so you feel you feel this person is a little strange and he he doesn't deal with devotees well because he doesn't understand them is that what you're saying yeah yeah and you don't say yeah i know him he's such a this or that no that's <laughs> that's not part of the listening process listening process is just to conf you're confirming what they're saying so you're saying he's like this uh, oh and then you're confirming the feeling oh that must be really difficult to deal with because you see you're seeing other devotees are being upset by what he's doing and they'll say yeah it's really hard so you've you've zoned in on what they're feeling and you're just trying to to understand is this what you're feeling is that are you feeling frustrated or you're feeling hurt because you see him 
hurting other devotees or you're feeling like a lack of inspiration, what's happening to our movement, that we have leaders that are not sympathetic or compassionate, you know, you're just trying to understand, you're trying to understand what they're feeling. You're not saying, you're not saying, yeah, oh, I know him, he's this and that, I've seen him, yeah, I feel the same way. You're not doing that. They'll, you will be tempted to do that if someone is talking about someone you know, and whatever they're saying, you are totally aware of, and you feel the same way, so that's difficult. So you have to be careful just to be able to hear and not get emotionally involved. So they're emotionally involved, but you as the listener, you can't be emotionally involved. Your emotional involvement is just in them and how they feel and what they're saying. So you, you want to feed back, okay, so what... I want to be clear, you're saying this, that, and that. They want to be heard. So when you feed back and you tell them, so what I understand you're saying is this devotee seems to be very black and white and he can't understand things that um, may be more in the middle. It's either it's all right or it's all wrong. It's all good, it's all bad. And he's having, and it's having a bad effect on the people under him for these reasons. Is that what you're saying? And they'll say, if that's what they said, they'll say, yes, that's what I'm saying. And they'll feel heard. So that's important. That now it's not just that they're seeing this and they're frustrated with it, but they're feeling heard by you. And so, oh, someone understands me. There's a story this person was coming to the temple, and he was disturbed about something. And he spoke to a devotee, and the devotee teaches, the devotee teaches empathic listening. So he, this person was complaining about something, and no devotee would listen to it because he was complaining about ISKCON or leadership. So generally, when somebody's complaining, we're like, I don't want to listen to this. So this devotee, because he teaches empathic listening, he said, so what you're saying is you feel frustrated with this and this should change and devotees shouldn't do this. And the person said, yes. He said, you're the first person. He said, you are the first person who's understood me. And he was just satisfied being understood. It kind of, in a sense, solved the problem. Like, like for example, let's say you see something going wrong in the temple and the GBC comes. And so you speak to the GBC about this problem and the GBC says, so what you're saying is we have a problem with this, this, and this. And the GBC says, well, that must be really frustrating to, to deal with these situations because you, you can't, no one's listening to you. And no one's, no one's respecting your opinion. And you feel heard. You feel, wow, that's amazing. My GBC heard me. He feels me. That in itself is huge. That in itself, that in itself could satisfy you, even if the GBC doesn't do anything. Just the fact that he knows what's going on, he's heard you, he's, he's confirmed that he heard exactly what you said, and he sympathized with how you feel. That's huge, isn't it? So that's what was going on with this, this boy He'd been seeing things in the temple that were disturbing him, and no one would listen to him. And then finally, this one devotee listened, and he said, I feel heard. You're the first person who's ever acknowledged this. And just, just that acknowledgement was enough. Okay, he's not going to do anything. He's not gonna, he doesn't need to complain any longer. So for some people, that's all they need. They, they just need to be heard. And we had... We had, I believe we had discussed previously that sometimes what you're hearing is going to be different than what I was saying before. Okay, this person is complaining about the temple president. He's complaining about such and such devotee. And you agree. You said, yeah, that's a problem. That's easy to hear. But there's another situation that's difficult. And that situation is he's complaining and you disagree, or he's complaining about people that you think that his complaints are just being made up, that this person is not doing what he says, this person doesn't have the motives that this 
person who's complaining thinks he has. So let's say you know somebody and you know their motive is very pure and this person is complaining. He's just doing this because he wants recognition or whatever. So he's, he's pointing out an impure motive and you know that's not true. That's hard to listen to. You like that devotee. This person is complaining about him and you want to let, you want to give your ear so that he can get it off his chest. That's really difficult to do because now this person, what, what you have to hear is what you disagree with. So that's a real challenge, but you're, you're thinking I'm doing this as a service. So I'm going to, I'm going to listen to him and then say, so you think so-and-so is motivated because you see that sometimes he does this and you're not saying, well, I don't think so. That's wrong. You're wrong, Prabhu. Actually, you're in total Maya, Prabhu, and I don't want to talk to you anymore. Okay. So if you want to do the service of listening, you don't want to say that. You Now, we have talked about this before. Let's say you feel that it is pure blasphemy and you actually can't listen. Then you just tell them, you tell them, say, Prabhu, uh, I know this devotee really well and I have deep affection for him and it's really hard for me to listen to this. And I think you need to talk to someone else. I can't, it's just hard for me. Now, there are, are cases where that's going to be true, where this person is dear to you or you know this person in such a way that what's being told about him is hurting you, to, hurting you to the point where you actually can't listen. So rather than tell the person, you're wrong, you're in Maya, stop blaspheming, this and that. If you're trying to be in the mood of a listener, which is a kind of therapy, then you just say, I'm sorry, I can't listen to this. This is too difficult for me. Now, there may be cases where it's difficult for you, but you know that by listening, the person's going to work through it. And we had talked about this before. So you have to make that distinction. So if you think, okay, I don't agree with this person and my emotions are riling up. I'm getting a little upset with him for saying that. But I, I sense that this person is just hurt temporarily and that I, this person is hurt temporarily and that I just need to listen, although it's difficult for me. But because I know he's going to work or she's going to work through it, I will listen. So that's, that's your challenge. That's your challenge to be able to listen to a person, talk about something that you disagree with. That's challenge number one. But you're in the mood, you're thinking, you're, you're, you're not getting emotionally involved at all. You're not saying, I don't agree with you. This is wrong. You're in Maya. You know, wash your mouth with soap, etc. If that's the case, you just say, uh, um, I, it's really hard for me to hear this because I, I like this devotee or I know this devotee. And um, it would be better if you talk to someone else. I can't do this. In the, in the professional world, they do this also. They just, you know, like, like maybe you love Donald Trump and someone's revealing how much they hate him and you might say, I can't listen to this. It's, it's mo emotionally, I'm not present for this. I just can't be present for this. So that would also be more of a rare case. So generally, the challenge, as, I, as I'm saying, is to not get emotionally involved. Somebody saying something and you... you uh, Somebody's saying something, and I think Ajita, it's, it's from your side, because my broadcast is, from my side, is good. I don't know if anyone else has a problem. It must be from your side. Maybe refresh or something. But from this side, it's good. Or unless you, yeah, unless someone else says it's interrupted. But even if it is, I can't do anything other than keep talking. So maybe you have to refresh or log in and out again or something. Yeah, so if they can hear in China, then 
and you can't hear in Hong Kong. What does that say about Hong Kong? China has surpassed Hong Kong. Jin Fan can hear from Shanghai, and Ajita cannot hear from Hong Kong. You're going to have to complain to the government, Ajita, that your internet is interrupting class, and your spiritual life is depending on it. You know, in Vedic times, if, if there were problems, the citizens could complain to the king because there weren't supposed to be any problems. And even if there were problems in the weather, they would complain to the king. Things are good in Oslo, so the conclusion is Hong Kong has been cursed. Yeah. Okay, so it's good. Do you know that? If the weather was bad, you can complain to the king. Uh, a son dies untimely, you can complain to the king. Is that amazing? The king is supposed to follow God's order so that everything is perfectly working. So if there's not enough rain, it's his fault. If things are disturbed, it's his fault. He has to deal with it. Wow, that's like totally amazing, isn't it? So, so we go back to this point, the challenge, the challenge that we have in listening is that sometimes someone's going to be talking to us and we want to listen and feed back and sympathize and empathize. And they're going to be saying things which <laughs> we don't agree with. And we may have an emotional response. Like, you know, I really love so-and-so Prabhu. He's just, he's just the best. And, um, and you're thinking, you're thinking in your mind that this devotee is creating problems. But the person you're listening to is saying, he's the best, he's the greatest, I don't understand why people don't like him. And you can't say, well, maybe they don't like him because of this reason or that reason. You have to just feed it back. So you, so you don't understand because you see this devotee as such a nice devotee, you don't understand why people don't like him. They're like, yeah, I just don't understand. And, you, and you're thinking, well, I can tell you why people don't like him, but you can't say that because you're in the mood of listening. And if she said, could you help me understand why people don't like him? And then you say, you, you want me to, you're asking me to explain. And then you say, well, it, perhaps maybe we could consider this or, you know, that sometimes he does this or says that. So perhaps some people misunderstand that or people, people are more, um, you know, they want to see things change. And they don't feel things are going on well and he doesn't want to change anything and maybe that's upsetting him. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you don't, you have to be very careful. So you're like, well, I can tell you, you know, what's wrong with him. You know, I've seen this for years, you know. Take out your pen and paper and, you know, I'm going to give you a list of 108 things that are wrong with him. It's not like that. Um, okay. So the next thing, I have to make this class short because... I found out last night that the call I was supposed to have today that I thought was at 4.30 a.m. is at 8 a.m. And so I can't change that. So the third and what I believe the most difficult thing to do is to empathically listen, feedback, and also feedback the emotions of someone who's complaining about you. It's not so difficult to hear when they're complaining about someone else. Really easy to hear if you don't like that person. A little more difficult to hear if you like the person. Easy to hear if you're kind of neutral you don't, or you don't know the person. The more you like the person, the more difficult it is. And if they're talking about you, that's really difficult. So, Prabhu, so what you're saying is that I'm a stupid, idiot, fool, rascal number one, does everything wrong, has never done anything right in his life, and is creating a complete mess in the lives of all the devotees in this temple. And the person says, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. He said, well, you must really feel frustrated with me and angry with me and... You must feel like I am 
like I'm kind of like the devil in Iskar. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. How difficult is it to hear that? Yeah, very difficult. I, I studied empathic listening. I practiced it in seminars. I've read books about it. And I must confess that that is the most difficult thing to listen to. And if we can master that, then we're kings of the universe. Maybe we should make a movie, Kings of the Universe. And say, what are the kings of the universe? Kings of the universe are those who can listen to people when they tell them what's wrong about them or tell them what they need to do to improve. And that is the um, height of humility. And, and the thing is, okay, well, I have to talk a little bit about humility to be able to bring this into context. Pride, you, pride is, how do I want to say this? Pride brought us into the material world. Pride will keep us in the material world. Pride is the furthest, the furthest distance, the longest distance you can get between you and Krishna is pride. And the closest distance you can get between you and Krishna is humility. I'm going to say that again. This is like, get, if you get this, this is Krishna consciousness in three seconds. Pride is the furthest distance away from Krishna. Humility is the closest distance. Just when you're humble, you're at Krishna's feet. When you're proud, your universe is away. If we understand that, that's the whole, anything I could ever say about humility, that's the sutra. It's all contained in that. And, and that's why you go on, when you understand that, you understand why Srila Bhakti Siddhanta so much emphasized not being critical of other devotees, because even if what they're doing is bad, but when you criticize them, you lose your humility. And humility is the entranceway to bhakti. You, you can't do it without it, right? So, understanding that deeply, I don't know if you deeply understand it from a, a three-sentence sutra, but I, is, I would assume you understand something about what I'm saying. So, understanding that, then when we're getting feedback and people are saying, oh, you made this mistake, you made that mistake, then if we think, okay, this is an opportunity for me to practice humility or to become humble by acknowledging. So what you're saying is that I've done this, I'm sorry, I did this, or what you're saying is I, I hurt this person and you must feel really angry right now with me and you probably feel really let down that I did that. To be able to do that, that requires a lot of humility, maybe more humility than most of us have at this point in our Krishna consciousness. But if we're in a situation where that happens, and I've been in that situation, and I think we all have been in that situation, and if you're so fortunate to have not been in that situation, it's likely you will someday be in that situation. To be able to think, here is an opportunity to practice humility, here is an opportunity to advance in humility, it can enable you to be able to hear. Here is an opportunity to learn more about myself. Here is an opportunity to see the anarthas within me. Is that easy to do? No. What I am saying is it is extremely difficult from my own personal experience. But what I'm saying is, if we understand the vast importance of humility and how destructive pride is and how humility brings us closer to Krishna and pride takes us away, pride is why we came, pride is what keeps us away, humility is what will bring us to the lotus feet of Krishna. And so humility is so important that if there is an opportunity, if I have an opportunity to practice humility by you telling me what's wrong with me, if internally I can accept that as something positive, then I can listen. Say, thank you for sharing. That was really important. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you said that. 
Now, here's the problem. I've seen it in others and I've experienced it myself. When I was a young devotee, I was put in charge of a temple. And Prabhupada always said, the temple president or any authority in ISKCON should be followed. So the devotees, they, you know, they would naturally follow the authority. So what I said as the temple president was kind of like generally the last word on everything. That's kind of how the movement ran in those days. But Prabhupada was, I mean, they weren't, presidents weren't dictators. They were nice people. But Prabhupada wanted us to work with their authority. So whatever they said, we worked with. So I became a president at the age of 20. And I'd only been a devotee eight months. And since that time, I had become temple president on three other occasions. And in between my stints as temple president, I was either in charge of Sankirtan, college preaching, congregational preaching. And, and then um, I took charge of other programs, and then I became a guru. And so pretty much I'm used to being an authority. I'm used to being in a position where people don't generally tell you you did something wrong. And so for those of us who were leaders from an early point in our life, and we're used to telling people what's wrong with them, it can be extremely difficult for someone to tell us what's wrong with us, especially if it's not their position. Well, they're a junior and they shouldn't say that. Now, from the point of view of etiquette, that's true. But from the point of view of practicality of running an organization, as, as you grow in Krishna consciousness, as you get more authority, more leadership it, it, positions, it's very easy to not be able to hear what people have to say about you. But it's absolutely essential to be able to do it. Now you might say, okay, you're asking me to, to, to be able to take feedback from junior people. And in Vaishnav etiquette, it's usually that feedback is given by the seniors to the juniors, not the other way around. And that's true. That's the etiquette. And we have to follow that etiquette. But sometimes we have to give feedback because the seniors may be doing something that's disturbing a situation, causing a problem. And so we have to follow etiquette. But in some way, we have to do that. And then we as leaders, we can't say, well, you're a junior, you shouldn't say anything. We have to be able to hear. Now you might say, well, my superiors don't hear, so why should I? Well, the saying goes, two wrongs don't make a right. Because we, we Prabhupada trained us that the leaders should be listened to, then the leaders think, well, nobody should give me feedback. But in the corporate world, they know, they understand that feedback must be given because the leader has a job to fulfill. And unless there's some accountability, how will he know that he's failing? So they have this thing called 360 degree feedback. So you get feedback from different people. Am I doing okay? Um, we don't have a lot of that in ISKCON because we have an etiquette that that's generally not what you do. So if some junior is giving you feedback, then you're probably thinking, oh, that's not right, and just be quiet. You can't say that, and, and that's offensive or whatever. And so that's understandable that a leader would think that way, because his whole life, he's never had to listen to feedback, except maybe from God brothers. He's only had to tell people how they need to improve. So this is difficult. I'm not saying it's not difficult. I'm saying it is important, but difficult. And so if we have a desire to become more humble, if that's there in our heart, it'll be easier to listen to feedback. So what you're saying is that I let you down because I did this and that, and that wasn't right. And, and, and so you, you hear that. You don't, say, you, don't, you don't start making excuses. You just hear it. I mean, you may make excuses because you might feel that it'll diffuse the situation because the excuses are not excuses. Actually, there's a reason you did that. But first you listen to what they're saying to make sure you've understood what they're saying, then they feel satisfied. 
and, and you reflect what you feel they may be feeling. So maybe today Krishna will do that to me, maybe today Krishna will do that to you, that some junior is going to tell you, or even, even sometimes a senior tells you, or your spiritual master tells you, even that's difficult, what to speak of a junior. Nobody wants to be told they did something wrong. That's really difficult to hear. But uh, sometimes we have to hear, right? So I just wanted to, it, this, this follows from what we were speaking last week about uh, one of the problems is that leadership we need to give feedback to leadership and leaders need to be able to hear it and have systems by which they can hear. And so someday when you become a leader, or you may be a leader now because there are people who respect you as a leader, or respect you as a senior, uh, you have to learn to be able to hear. If you've done something wrong and they point it out, if you can hear it and feed it back, then you are... Yeah, you are one of the gods of the universe, because to do that is not easy. But to do it, I believe, is a, is a manifestation of the humility that we are trying to develop as devotees. And, and we all know that humility is difficult, and we all know that sometimes we become upset or we become proud or obstinate and we won't listen. But we should be aware that any time we're acting out of pride, it's taking us away from Krishna. It's even, in the, even if we're doing devotional service, which is bringing us to Krishna, the pride is taking us away. So there's, you know, we're counteracting the good we're doing. So pride is the enemy. And so it's nice to see how pride manifests, and one of the ways pride manifests is by not being able to hear when we're given feedback about something we said or did or thought that was wrong. By the way, I just wanted to make a side point because I just read this, and this comes up a lot. In the Bhagavatam, as you know, Prabhupada said in Kali Yuga, there's no sinful reaction for thinking about committing a sin. So I I think about eating meat, which obviously nobody would. But if I did, there's no sin. I think about drinking wine, there's no sin. I think about gambling, there's no sin. I think about illicit sex, there's no sin. I've just vowed not to do it. Of course, I shouldn't think about it. But if I do, there's no sinful reaction. But, but, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, and this is my experience also, and I've explained this before, but he confirmed it. If you make offense to a devotee in your mind, that is an offense. You can't think, well, it's just in my mind. I didn't say it. It's an offense. It's aparad. It's Vaishnava aparad. It's worse if you say it, but it's already aparad if you think it. So you can't apply that idea of, well, it's not a sin if it's only your mind to Vaishnava aparad. So, Someone may be giving you feedback and you think, oh, this person's so offensive. All right, good, you don't, you don't say anything. But that's a form of pride, thinking in your mind, oh, they're offensive. So, so we want to come to this point of humility, which might take 20, 100,000 lifetimes, but we're going to try to do it in this lifetime. Actually, we're going to try to do it right now. We're going to try to get it in our heart right now, that if someone's giving me feedback about how to improve I should honor it, respect it, even be enthusiastic about it because it's going to help me practice humility and it's also going to help me become more humble. Okay, so since we only have 10 more minutes, I am going to go back to your questions. I did notice your questions, but sometimes I don't stop because um, I lose my train of thought and my enthusiasm. Um, so, so these questions or comments now are going to go back to the things that I was speaking about. So it was kind of a review. Krishna Karshani says, I'm wondering if the spiritual master is obliged to hear about personal problems or complaining from disciples. My guru, Indra told me once 
that his disciples are fine, they don't need to contact him. But if they have a problem, they write him, expecting him to solve problems. In most cases, they created by themselves. I think that's actually, I don't, I don't think there's a standard of what the spiritual master should and shouldn't do, but naturally the disciple doesn't want to burden their spiritual master with problems. They want to burden him with reports of all the wonderful preaching and good sadhana they're doing. That's, that's what a disciple wants to do. But in situations where they feel they need to ask their spiritual master and they can't ask anybody else, then they ask. And if there are senior devotees around and it's not a big issue and anybody can answer it, then sometimes when someone asks me a question, I would say, why are you asking me? You could ask the local devotees. And ask me if it's, if it's something more intricate or difficult or nobody can solve the problem or it's a question between guru and disciple that only the guru can answer. Now, you, you see, in the early days of the movement, Prabhupada was personally involved with all his disciples and answering all the questions, but there was no one else to answer the question, number one. Then when he got busy, he would say, ask your GBC. Go to your GBC, ask them. If they can't deal with it, come to me. So, something like that. So, you know, the spiritual master is giving so much through his articles, through his classes, through his books. So that's generally, and through the service you have. So that's generally. Sometimes devotees ask me things, and um, I wonder if they think that I'm, you know, ask me like things that anybody could a answer, you know, like practical things, not philosophical things. Um, and so why me, you know? If every, you know, I was just thinking today, I have. Let's say I have a hundred disciples, right? And if I have to take ten minutes, for just ten minutes with a hundred disciples, that's a thousand minutes divided by sixty. So that's like sixteen and a half hours. Sixteen and a half hours a month. So you think, well, that's not much. Well, multiply it by five when I have five hundred disciples, right? So then it becomes like, I can't do anything because I'm just answering questions. It'll take me like two weeks to answer everybody's question. So obviously that, that, that and if I have a thousand disciples and each disciple has a question that takes me 10 minutes to answer, that pretty much is my life, just answering their questions. Now, some guru may just do that and say, I'm just here to answer your questions. That's what I do. I don't do, I don't have any other service. I don't write books, I don't give classes, I don't have projects. So I'm just a teacher, and that's all I'm doing. Um, uh, but even if that were the case, logistically speaking, you probably couldn't handle more than like 20 people, if you, or 20, 30, 40 people. You'd just be like a teacher dedicated to those students and helping them. With, and, and obviously, that's what some disciples want. And in the ancient times, it was kind of like that. You lived at the ashram, and you're, it was just like a limited number, and you were there. Or maybe not a limited number, but you were there, and you instructed, and like that. And so, also, by doing these classes every week, you have a chance to ask questions. So, but the answer to your question is ask your guru the question about questions. And, yes... Uh, if, I would say if, if a disciple is doing well, at least for me personally, but your Guru Maharaj has 4,000 disciples, so he couldn't manage the nail. But if someone's doing well, I like to hear about it. Report, tell me, how well, what are you doing? We've distributed so many books, we made so many devotees, we opened so many temples, we did these programs, chanting so many rounds, you know, so many Hari Nams, whatever it is, we would report that to Prabhupada, he'd like that. Of course, the temple presidents were reporting, not the individual disciples, but um, still occasionally, you know, when a disciple has, um, you know, ecstatic news, it, it encourages the spiritual master. One time, uh, oh, it's a nice story. 
So one temple president, he put on this big John Mostomy in the early, very early days of South Africa. And like 50,000 people came. It's probably like 19, it was 1977 and Prabhupada's last days. And when Prabhupada got the news, he was so, he was so energized by that news. And he said, my chest swells when I think that I have disciples that can do such wonderful preaching. So that inspired Prabhupada. But, you know, incessive, incessant problems, the spiritual master is a problem, 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 problem. That's hard for the spiritual master. So we should try to resolve our problems with local, with local devotees, seniors, mentors. And then in cases when that can't be resolved, there are practical things that the spiritual master is involved with. Of course, you have to ask him. I'm writing books. We have so much discussion between editors people doing layout, people doing translation, and they want to know what I think. I haven't turned it over to somebody else. So, but sometimes I'll just say, ask this person, they know more than I do. So just be sensitive to it. So Katie says, uh, I'm going to watch this later, I'm working. Hmm. She can't watch now, okay, we'll forgive you. And next question or comment. Krishna Karshani says, I think the problem is that we created in this kind of culture of not hearing devotees in general. I mean that we're preaching that a devotee should only listen to the elders without complaining. Yeah, but that is our culture. And if you say something, it's considered an offense. It's our culture, but here's the problem. The, you know, respect is given up and mercy is given down. That's the general idea, right? So you don't want to complain about your elders. You want to respect them. But, but the elders shouldn't be so proud that they create a fence around them that, you, the, that if you have a situation that you need to deal with that they can't listen. So, so even though, even though you should give respect to the elders, the elders should be able to, to be open enough to listen, to give feedback. Just like last night we had a, a tithing uh, donor uh, dinner in Alachua. So you invite all the devotees who were donors and we had uh, nice performance by Hubby's daughter, Danya. Amazing, actually amazing performance. And we had Chaturatma telling jokes and emceeing. And then the GBC spoke, Temple President spoke, a few other devotees spoke. And they were saying, you know, if, if, if there's anything that we're not doing well or anything you want to do, just tell us. GBC said that and Temple President said that. So in a sense, you can say, well, they're their authorities, so they have the authority to control everything. And, but as a good leader, they said, tell us. So they take a humble position, tell us, we want to hear. So that, that means that it allows for more than just the etiquette, there's a relationship where we want to be open. And, um, and sometimes it's not even a criticism, it's just Oh, Temple President, if we could do this, it would be better. Or Guru Maharaj, if you could do this, it would be better for the devotees. It could be something simple. It's not that you're finding fault. Or Guru Maharaj, you know, you told so-and-so something, but I just want to let you know that so-and-so is really discouraged now by hearing that. You know, it's not your fault that you, what you said is right, but this devotee is very sensitive, and I don't think you that she could hear what you said. And, oh, thank you for telling me. I'll, I'll talk to her. So as a leader, we should be, we, sh we shouldn't be guarded. And if, if there is a serious problem that's hurting a devotee, then the leader should be open enough to listen. Otherwise, um, he's going to cause a problem for that devotee. So it's, a, it's sensitive. It's easier if the leader just opens up and says, yes, you can tell me. It's harder if he doesn't and you try to tell him. And 
So I understand it's sensitive, and I, I understand some leaders may feel that it's not the position of a junior to say anything. But my observation is that if he has, if he's doing something which which may be proper, but in the context he's doing it, it may be having, it may be counterproductive. It would be good that if he knew it, and maybe it's only the disciples who are going to tell him they're the only ones who see that, or you're the only one who knows that what Guru Maharaj said to this devotee or what the GBC said to this devotee of the temple present, you're the only one who knows that this is this is really creating a problem for this devotee. And you'll you'll have to somehow explain it to him. Or you'll have to explain it to somebody who can explain it to him. And then uh, but we're but we're talking here about ourselves as leaders because we can't control anyone else. But in a in a perfect world, that as leaders we we should be humble enough to hear uh, if you know. So then then it brings up. But but isn't the guru perfect and can't the guru make mistakes and and sometimes to walk Krishna Raj would. Prabhupada say we should do this and he would say I don't think it's a good idea and he would explain why and Prabhupada would say okay so it was like a practical thing so he wasn't he wasn't afraid out of interest out of best interest for Prabhupada okay Let's see what else we I don't think giving feedback senior devotee will work if you would give feedback to our GBC is making serious mistakes he would not accept it I can make most humble and respectful way. Still, well, that's the point that don't try it if it's not going to work. He will not accept it and relate to it. Yeah. Um, so, but we're talking, okay, so if that's true, then you understand, okay. But then the next step is if you if you feel something is, is really, really needs to be dealt with, then you would go to a god brother of his or or you would go to the EC and say, we have this problem in our country. Uh, I don't think the GBC will listen to it or be open to it. Or maybe you have to explain it to him for him to see his response. Maybe you'll be surprised. Maybe he would respond. But if he doesn't respond and you feel it's a problem that really needs addressing or it's going to create disastrous situations, then you would go to the EC. That's the committee of the GBC and say, this is the situation, explained it to our GBC, he didn't agree. And then they would deal with it. Or maybe there's a way you could explain it to him to get in. Or maybe you just don't do anything. So that's from your side up. But we're talking about more from our side up down when people come to us. So something to consider maybe maybe i'm not humble so when i go up they take offense or maybe i'm not humble so when people come up i turn them off both things are difficult yeah that's the whole point of the class both things are difficult it's difficult to be humble it's probably the most difficult thing we're all going to face in our journey to be krishna conscious but as i joked before although it's somewhat true you have these security gates when you go to the spiritual world the four Kumaras went through seven security gates, and each security gate is a different, is a different anar. It tests you for a different anartha. Ah, greed, get out of here. Lust, out. So maybe no lust, no greed. Pride, out. So pride is that you know it's pride destroys bhakti, and pride is that thing that's keeping us away from Krishna. So. And humility is essential. How can we chant the holy name if we're not humble? So it's, it's what I'm trying to point out is that in situations that Krishna puts us in, he gives us authority. We're a temple president, we're a GBC, we're a sannyasi, we're a guru, or we're a senior devotee, and you'll all be senior if you stay in ISKCON long enough. So you get some authority. And now once you have authority, it's easy to be, it's much easier to be humble when you have no authority, but when you have authority, it's much more difficult to be humble. And so it's just a challenge we need to be aware of. Uh, and it, it's a challenge on the part of the junior, if he sees something wrong, 
how he will deal with it. It's a challenge for everybody to remain humble and respectful, going up and going down. But my observation is the problems, the problems can be more easily solved from top. So if all respect goes to the guru and the guru is humble, then it works. If all respect goes to the guru and the guru is proud, we have a problem. We have a power problem. A problem of autocracy could develop. But if the guru feels like I'm the lowest, I'm just the servant of my disciples, then things are good. And then the disciple just has to maintain the etiquette. Right, Anarhari Sakara has written, if the guru falls down, let's say the guru breaks a principle or is engaged in sense gratification and he can't stop, He's just, he just continues his engagement in sense gratification in some way. He's just spending all day at the beach, surfing, not chanting his rounds, like what's going on? Now Hari Sakara says, the disciples must go to the spiritual master and tell him, Guru Maharaj, please stop this, stop doing this. So it's even there within Vaishnava etiquette. If it, if it gets to a certain threshold where the guru falls, the disciples are meant actually to pick him up. Guru Maharaj, get back on your feet. We need you. We depend on you. So it is there. And obviously these things are sensitive, but these things are real. We deal with them. Um, Shankarshani says, we are learning from seniors, so if they don't listen to inferior devotees, if young will become senior, they are. Exactly. But we're also learning from mistakes. So, in, in everybody has their style, and not every person is able to listen from, to, to juniors. As I said, listening about our own mistakes is really difficult. And as I said, it's not easy, and I don't expect that everyone is going to be really good at it. Um, but it would be useful if you become a leader to take courses on listening, on how to listen and how to be open and how to feedback, because these skills are invaluable. And, and this was the purpose of doing this course, was ultimately for all of you, when you become older devotees, so you'll be able to listen. And also, so you'll be able to help your peers or your juniors by listening to their problems. And if you ever become a leader, you know you're not perfect. So you are going to make mistakes sometimes. So you have to be willing to recognize those mistakes and rectify them. Now, sometimes you recognize them yourself. But occasionally, you know, a very sincere, respectful person may come and say, you know, I don't think you should do this because it's causing this problem. Okay. And maybe in this country over here, it was working. It didn't cause problems. It actually inspired devotees. But in this country, it's causing problems. You know, there's a devotee um, who does workshops and seminars, and people love them. But in some parts of the world, people won't love them. So is this devotee doing something wrong? No. This devotee is preaching Krishna consciousness. But in some certain context of the culture or the nature of the devotees there, the one this devotee is saying won't be appreciated entirely. So the devotee didn't do anything wrong. But someone tells this devotee, say, you know, if you preach this way in this country, it's not going to work. Oh, thank you for telling me that. Or, what do you mean it's not going to work? This is what Prabhupada said. If it doesn't work, let them go to hell. They're all bogus. You know, so we don't want to be leaders like that. I have to go. We will see you next time, which is tomorrow at 7 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We can talk more about this. If you have questions, think about your questions. Uh, invite people to come to this class, because I think it's... Uh, uh, how to give feedback to a Maharaj that's rude even from the ways you may not be able to give feedback you may have to give it to um, the god brother of Maharaj who um, and you know sometimes that's where it starts you talk to a senior and say look 
this is how I feel. Because the senior may say, well, actually, he's not like that, or that's just your interpretation, it's not like that. And you go, okay. So that could be also. So we'll have to say goodbye. We will see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.